Amen. Thank you, Gerald. Let me invite you, if you have a Bible, to go ahead and open it up to Genesis chapter 42. Genesis 42 is where we'll be this morning. If you are a guest with us, this is what we do. We just go to the Bible after singing and just look at what the Bible says, find out what the story is, hopefully uh, get a feel for the meaning in the story, and then apply some of the truths we find in the Bible. Everything that goes on uh, here at Hickory Grove from the pulpit uh, ha has to be tied to the Bible. And we're following along in the story of Genesis. We've been watching in Joseph's life. And in Genesis 42, Joseph is included, but we reach back and uh, get a feel for what's going on with his brothers and uh, with his dad. Genesis 42. As you're turning there, I wanted to mention to you, uh, it doesn't affect us much here at North, but at our main campus, we ha do have a new staff member. His name is Olivier Hakazamana. Olivier Hakazamana. Uh, the way I've, uh, I keep saying it over and over again so I get it right. That's why I've said it twice with uh, flawless perfection just now. <laughs> His last name, Hockey Zamana. Think about the game of hockey and then add Zamana on the back of it. Olivier, he is uh, originally from Burundi. He will be serving as our associate worship pastor at our main campus. He's married. Uh, his wife's name is Megan. They have a child, I think eight or nine months old. Her name is Zuri, and uh, I'll send an email out this afternoon. You'll see it and have the full description. But I wanted you to be aware of that. He's being announced uh, at main campus and look forward to the job that he'll do there. All right, Genesis chapter 42. If you found that, let me invite you to stand, and we'll read together God's Word. Now, this story, you know, this chapter, each one of these is a long chapter. And so what I thought we'd do today is uh, let's read the first six verses. I'll, re I'll read that, and then we'll go back and just sort of rehearse the story, and then maybe make some points from the story in Genesis 42. As you think of it, I forgot to mention this. I would appreciate you praying for me this evening. Today I'll go to Greensboro. Uh, there's the uh, North Carolina Baptist State Convention is going on this week, and tonight begins the pastor's conference, and I am the very first preacher at the pastor's conference tonight at 6 o'clock, preaching from Revelation chapter 2, verses 1 through 7. And I haven't written the sermon. So I don't know what I'm going to do. Y'all pray that it goes well. Uh, pray that it goes well today. I'm going to need some sort of multiplication of the bread uh, and fish today. Genesis chapter 42. We'll start in verse 1. Grass withers and the flowers fade, but the word of our God stands forever. Let's begin now. Verse 1. When Jacob learned that there was grain for sale in Egypt... He said to his sons, Why do you look at one another? <laughs> and he said, Behold, I have heard that there is grain for sale in Egypt. Go down and buy grain for us there, that we may live and not die. So ten of Joseph's brothers went down to buy grain in Egypt. But Jacob did not send Benjamin, Joseph's brother, with his brothers, for he feared that harm might happen to him. Thus the sons of Israel came to buy among the others who came, for the famine was in the land of Canaan. Now Joseph was governor over the land. He was the one who sold all of the people of the land. And Joseph's brothers came and they bowed themselves before him with their faces to the ground. Join me as we pray. Father, I pray that in your grace, you would reach into the hearts of hard people. We pray for those that are not even here this morning, whose hearts are hard toward you and toward us. That you would make hard grace a reality. For any prodigal son or daughter that's away living in a far country, Father, I pray that you would make it so miserable that they might turn to you. For any person here today, Lord, whose heart is stone, I pray that by the Spirit of God you might give them ears to hear and eyes to see and a heart to believe the joyful 
grace-filled gospel of Jesus. And so help us now. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You may be seated. <clears throat> More than likely, if you are a parent, you are familiar with the concept of tough love. Some of you are just tough. <laughs> tough love. You know, tough love is something that a parent does that is seemingly or maybe genuinely painful in the life of a child, but it is done in an effort to bring about some sort of ultimate good. It's love, but it's tough love. Well, that's not exactly what's going on here in Genesis 42, but it's close. Genesis 42 turns us aside from having Joseph as the main character. Since chapter 37, Joseph has been the main character. Now Genesis 42 takes us aside from seeing Joseph as the main character. And, and this chapter casts our eyes back on his father, Jacob, and his sorry brothers. We're going to look at them just for a little bit. You, you know what's happening, right? If you've been following along, the long-awaited dream. Remember chapter 37, he had the dream about the famine and how everybody would bow down to him. The long awaited dream and the famine is here. At the end of chapter 41, the famine has now crept out and affected all. You see it in verse 57, 41 and 57. It, it, it's affected every part of the land. Over the whole earth, over the known world, it's affecting Joseph's family. They're all scrambling for food. You understand a famine means there's no food. And to get food, see how God worked his plan? To get food, they got to go down to Egypt. But what good Hebrew wants to go down to Egypt. I mean, Egypt is almost 300 miles from Canaan land. Plus, if they go down there, they're going to be foreigners. On top of this, those 10 scheming brothers, remember Benjamin is innocent. Those 10 brothers, Egypt is a byword. Egypt held a secret that they've kept buried for over 20 years up to this point. For years, they've been able to live their lives. Some of you know what this feels like. They've been able to live their lives without ever actually having to think about God. Even after many years, you know, guilt after many years, guilt doesn't sleep. Guilt grows. And now they've, they've butted up against this crisis. Now they can't find food. And there's only one place, because of their brother, which they don't know, there's only one place where you can get food, and that's down in Egypt. You know, it's a crisis, right? It's a crisis. It's a bad situation. And God in this passage, this is what we're going to learn. God in this passage, he's going to use a crisis to get their attention. Now, now put a pause there and let's think about the brothers for a little bit. This is a hard bunch. This is a hard bunch and it's going to take hard grace to crack their hard hearts. Something you should know, those of you that run from God and you are hard now. You see, God will stop at nothing. God will stop at nothing to turn the hearts of his people to himself. Let's think about who we're dealing with just for a moment. I won't, I won't call out all of the brothers, but think about this bunch of brothers. The oldest of the brothers is a man named Reuben. That's Leah's firstborn child, Reuben. Reuben is proven to have weak character. Do you remember Reuben? He, he, had, he had an affair with his own father's mistress. And, and then another brother named Judah. Judah's not any better. I mean, chapter 38, I could, chapter 38 was so bad, I couldn't even preach 
chapter 38. There in chapter 38, Judah has an affair with his daughter-in-law. She gets pregnant with twins, produces two children. And if that's not bad enough, his original two sons, they were so evil that God struck them dead. I mean, go read the story sometime. Just don't read it out loud. <laughs> there are two other brothers that I'll mention, Simeon and Levi. Simeon and Levi, uh, they exacted vengeance because they're... Their sister had been abused, and so what they did to this village, instead of just the one, the one person that, that abused her, a whole village they deceived and then slaughtered all the men in that village. I just mentioned a few of the brothers. Now, take all of them collectively, all the brothers except Benjamin, they had a hand in selling Joseph into slavery. All of that to tell you, these are bad people. These are hard men. And my first question of the Bible is going to be, why in the world, why would God go after those guys? You know what the answer is? The answer is what we believe about the gospel. The answer is, is grace. The New Testament says, says it like this, that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Grace. But just like for some of you sitting here, it, it's got to be hard grace. In fact, that's how I'm going to give the theme. The title of my message today is Hard Grace, and here's the theme of the message. Hard grace brings about real hope. Hard grace... I want you to get, this is a new concept for some of you. Hard grace brings about real hope. I'll tell you what let's do. Let's, um, because there is a lot of text, I want to just uh, go through, I'll, let me run through the story. I'd like to point out some things to you and then come back and we'll just make hopefully some application that might be helpful. Join me in the story in chapter 42. There in chapter 42, our eyes have now turned to Jacob and the brothers. Jacob learned that there was grain in verse 1. Jacob learned that there was grain in Egypt, and he told the brothers, his sons, why are you standing here looking at one another? Just like a father, right? Why don't you do something? Why are you guys standing here looking at one another? There's food down in Egypt. Go down there and get it so that we might live and not die. Now notice verse 4. Verse 4 tells us that Jacob did not send Benjamin. That's important. Remember, Benjamin is uh, Joseph's brother. They're the two youngest. They are the only two sons that Rachel had. Rachel is the one that Jacob loves so much. Remember that love story? And when Benjamin, when it came time for him to be born, Rachel goes into labor. It's a hard labor. And Jacob has to stand there and watch as she dies. Before she dies, she names him Ben Ami, son of sorrow. Jacob can't stand that. He changes his name, Benjamin, son of my right hand. His wife, Rachel, dies. That affects him to such a degree, he buries her and puts a monument over her grave. Her other son, Joseph, he thinks that Joseph's dead. There's no way I'm letting Benjamin go. No way. There is some thought that maybe he knew what had happened to Joseph. At least he knew that those boys were responsible for Joseph. There's no way I'm sending Benjamin. So the brothers go. Ten of them. Benjamin stays home. The text says they go down to Egypt. They get there. And there in verse 6, we find it finally happens. There is Joseph. He's the governor. Governor. What a great word. In Hebrew, it means he has this exalted position. Uh, governor. Charles Haddon Spurgeon was a great preacher in England. He uh, was never ordained, so he never had reverend in front of his name, but everybody at his church called him the governor. I think that I'd like to change my name from pastor to governor. <laughs> governor. Uh, here, is, here is Joseph. He is the governor. He is in charge of everything, and those boys get there. Joseph didn't know they were coming. Can you imagine? He sees them come in. Verse 6 says, they bow down. 
You get to verse 9, we find out Joseph knows that now God's plan is being worked out. He remembers the dream down in verse 9. He immediately starts to to, um, interrogate them. It sounds like he's exacting vengeance. We'll come back and talk about that. He's interrogating them. He, in fact, says, uh, you are spies. You see that in verse 9? He says, you're spies. Verse 11, they say, no, we're not spies. We're the sons of of one man. How could we be spies? That wouldn't make any sense. And isn't it ironic, verse 11? We are honest men. I mean, they're saying this to Joseph. We're honest men. And so Joseph continues the interrogation, calling out, telling them, I'm going to test you. Four times he calls them spies. He says to them uh, in, in the text of the story, He says that I'm going to put all of you, in fact, what I'm going to do, I'm going to uh, hold you all in prison. I'll send one, and then you can bring back your little brother, Benjamin. But then he changes his mind. He doesn't do that. He puts them for three days, verse 17 and 18, uh, three days in prison. You think, that's really bad. Don't forget, Joseph spent 13 years in prison. Three days in prison, he lets them out, and instead of holding everybody and sending one, Through the course of events, he's going to send all of them home. You get to verse 21 and you see a crack in the armor. Dawn is starting to break. Remember, 20 years ago, and as soon as something bad happens, they realize this is because of what we did to Joseph. Verse 22, Reuben, the oldest, he's the spokesman. He speaks and says, you guys, I told you. See in verse 21? You should have listened to me. Now, Joseph is close by. He has an interpreter because they don't know that he is who he is. And although he has an interpreter, he understands what they're saying. And he is so broken by this. Verse 24 turns away weeping. comes back, gets his composure there in verse 24, and he, he decides after hearing Reuben say this, I'm not going to send, I, I'm going I'm to keep Simeon. He's the second oldest of Leah's sons. Verse 25, he fills up their bags full of all of their money and provisions, sends them on their way. They don't know that he's done that. Along the way, you read the story, down in verse 26 and verse 27, one of the brothers, we don't know who, found out that, hey, we've got our money with us. This is what is going on here. Verse 28, we hear the first time they mention God. When you get to verse 29, they finally got in home. They recount the story. I won't tell it again. They talk to their dad. They leave out some of the bad parts and just kind of give him an abbreviated. They're true sons. They, tell, they didn't tell lies. They just didn't tell the whole truth. And so they just kind of abbreviated the story. And uh, as they're emptying their sacks in verse 35, it's not just one of them that had money. All of their money's there. Jacob, he's a sad old man. Verse 36. Listen to what he says in verse 36. There's such turmoil. This family is so dysfunctional. He says to the brothers, you've bereaved me of my children. Joseph is no more. You see, you get the sense that he knew they had done something. Maybe not what it was, he knew they had done something. Joseph is no more. Simeon, he's stuck, he's no more. And you, you think you're going to take Benjamin? The, the one person that I had to sacrifice my wife to have? Reuben tries the last little defense there near the end in verse 37. Reuben irrationally says, I'll tell you what, you you just, you can hold me responsible and if I don't make it back, you can just kill my sons. But the chapter closes out, Jacob is unconvinced. He says, you're not going to, there's no way I'm letting Benjamin go. Now this chapter will, 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 it bleeds into chapter 43 and the whole story is really three or four chapters long and you couldn't do it justice in one sermon. We'll try to break it up into three or four sermons. But let's put a pause there and I want to take you back to the story now. 
And let's see if I can point out for you God's grace. I'll try to do it in three ways. Here's the first one, number one. I want you to see God's grace. If you're keeping score, this would be the first point. I want you to see God's grace in his powerful word. See God's grace in his powerful word. Go back with me there to the beginning of chapter 42. And you'll notice in the first six verses, verses 1 through 6, in the first section of this story, I want you to see how every bit of what is going on here is happening in order to fulfill God's word. You remember the dreams back in chapter 37 that Joseph had? Got him in such trouble. The dreams that his brother's sheaves would come in and bow down to him. Read verse 6. I'm going to show it to you. Verse 6. Now Joseph was governor over the land. He was the one who sold to all the people of the land. And Joseph's brothers came and bowed themselves before him with their faces to the ground. Just like what God's word said been a long time. There have been multiple obstacles in the way. There have been doubts along the way. But everything that God said would come to pass actually has come to pass. Isn't it amazing that the brothers that had tried to kill the dream, they now have unwittingly actually fulfilled the dream. You know what this reminds us? This reminds us that The grass withers and the flowers fade, but the word of our God stands forever. You see the brothers bowing down there in verse 6? Those brothers bowing down in front of Joseph, they are not sensitive people. Over in verse 9, you'll see it in verse 9. Verse 9 tells us that Joseph knew that all of this was a fulfillment of God's word. And it's happening in due time, and in due time the brothers are going to realize it. This tells us a couple of things. Let me just make uh, four, five, or six applications here. You know what? I'll, I'll make them quickly. Here's what this first section tells us. A, you, you can trust God's word even when evidence points to the, something contrary. You can trust God's word. You can feed off of God's word. You can build your life on God's word. Let me give you another application. Uh, Joseph, as God's man, reminds us, uh, here's the second thing, God is is faithful to his people. God calls you into something, it feels like you're alone, he is going to be faithful to you. What about the New Testament? How How do we use God's word for our understanding of our relationship to God? Well, here are a couple of things. One, if God's word is true, and that's my first point, then we are as sinful as God's word says we are. That we start not as neutral, we come into this world with sin. We're born out of sin. And if you keep pressing on God's word, you find out that that God tells us, or God's word tells us, that God actually hates sin. In fact, if God's word is true, it reminds us that God hates sin as much as the Bible tells us he does. You keep pressing on God's word, you find out that what Christ did, namely... Uh, His finished work on the cross, we get this out of God's Word, that it is the only thing that can actually save sinners from judgment. Here's a a sixth thing. I'll make this the final thing about the Bible. The Bible teaches us that at the cross we find out that God's grace, God's grace is greater than all of our sin. It's a hard grace. But, but see, hard grace brings about real hope. I want you to see God's grace in his powerful word. There's something else I think that's worthwhile in the story as the narrative goes. That's the first section. Let's go to the second section. Here's the second point. I want you to see God's grace in his hard mercies. I want you to see God's grace in his hard mercies. We, ha- we love the gentle mercies. I want to show you some hard mercies. Hard mercies, that's a, an unfamiliar concept for many people. It's the concept, if you had to define it. It is the concept of God going to great lengths, oftentimes painful and humbling lengths, to stab our conscience, to break our hard hearts. Why? 
so that we might see him for who he is as our sovereign Savior. I, 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 think, I think that's what God is doing to the brothers. Let's pick up the story and see if I can prove it from the Bible. Let's go from verse 6 down to verse 6. Let's see where they are. You see them bowed down. In verse, and by the way, I won't, I, won't finish to, I won't get to the last section. I just have a couple of sections. Verse 6, they're bowing down. They're down there in Egypt. They're bowing down before Joseph. Now notice it with me in verses 7 and 8. Verses 7 and 8, the Bible tells us that Joseph recognizes them, but they don't recognize him. It's been 20 years now. Here is Joseph. He's in Egypt. He probably is clean shaven. He might even have his whole head shaved. So they're not going to recognize him. And God starts breaking the brothers with a hard mercy. Let me show it to you in verse 12. There in verse 12, you'll notice that Joseph accuses them of being spies. Do you see it? He said to them, it's the nakedness of the land that you've come to see. You've come to spy it out. And four times he'll do it over and over again, calling them spies, even though he knows who they are, and it feels like vengeance. I mean, it feels like here those brothers have shown up and now Joseph is finally going to get them back. But nothing could be further from the truth. Behind all of the harsh threats, there is an affection. There is mercy. Let me show you some of it. Let me show you some of the mercy. Look with me down in verse 17 and 18. Do you notice verse 17 and 18? Let me read it to you. Notice how long they're in prison. He put them all together in custody for three days. And on the third day, Joseph said to them, Do this and you will live, for I fear God. Now, he put them in prison for three days, which sounds bad, but don't forget now, they were responsible for Joseph actually having been in prison for 13 years. And, and, and three days is just a little taste. Think about who he is. Remember I said the governor? He's in charge of so much. Joseph had authority to do whatever he wanted to do with those brothers. He had authority to put them to death. In the same way, these afflictions that we endure, the things we go through, the pain we have, they are nothing compared to Jesus Christ, the Son of God, taking on our sin and enduring the cross. There's something else to consider in verse 18, 19, and 20. Notice verse 18 and 19 and 20. He's going to let the brothers go. He's going to eventually hold back Simeon. He's going to let them go. Um, he does so so that they might go and provide for their families. Let me show it to you, verse 18, 19, and 20. On the third day, Joseph said to them, Do this and you'll live, for I fear God. If you are honest men, let one of your brothers remain confined where you are in custody and let the rest go and carry grain for the famine of your households. He's worried. Joseph is worried about their families. And bring your youngest brother to me so that your words will be verified and you will not die. And they did what he told them. Here you have a second indication of Joseph's mercy. He lets them go because he says that in verse 18, he fears God and he knows that this famine has them right on the margin. Their families are, are at home. They're starving. This is in the, reminds us in the same way, God, the Bible says in, in the Psalms, God knows us. He knows our frame. He knows that we are but dust. And he has mercy. Keep looking at verse 18 and 19. Verse 18 and 19, instead of keeping them all in prison, he's going to keep one person and send every, everybody else home. You know what this shows us? That Joseph, his, his motive is not revenge. He's not getting payback. His motive is redemption. You know what this reminds us? This is a principle that God does not hurt us for revenge or anger or punishment. 
If under the sovereign rule of God, you are going through and being hurt, it is there for redemption. That pain has a mission, and its mission is to get you to look to the cross of Jesus in true repentance. And, and in the story, stay in the story, in verse 21, in the story, the very first crack in their hard hearts starts to show itself in verse 21. Here, verse 21, the dawn, the dawn is breaking in verse 21. Let me read it to you. They said to one another, in truth, we are guilty concerning our brother in that we saw the distress of his soul when he begged us and we did not listen. That is why this distress has come upon us. They understand the law of retribution. And their hearts now are starting to break. You see, 20 years they got away with it. 20 years of the status quo. You ever tried to ignore guilt? 20 years of ignoring guilt. 20 years of carrying around all the stuff that each one of them had done. And verse 21, they just, they just start confessing it. Do you know what you have here? Here is a hard mercy. When you come to grips, this is a hard mercy. When you come to grips with such a terrible, such a terrible sin. You know what God is doing here? God is using Joseph to give them a rough treatment. More specifically, God has brought a famine to make all of this happen. God has brought a famine into the land so that these brothers might be reconciled to God and to one another. The theme of famine runs throughout the Old Testament and runs right into the New Testament. In fact, Jesus, who taught so well using parables, picks up the theme of famine in one of his most famous parables. It's the parable of the prodigal son. You probably know that parable. In fact, if you've got a Bible, I would invite you just to flip over to Luke chapter 15. Let me read you part of the story of the prodigal son. Luke chapter 15. Uh, the story picks up in about verse 11. If you've got a prodigal or you are a prodigal, here's a good spot to start listening. Let me read it to you. Jesus said, there was a man who had two sons, and the younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the share of my property that is coming to me. And he divided his property between them. Not many days later, the younger son gathered all that he had, and he took a journey into the far country. And there he squandered his property in reckless living. And when he had spent everything, all the money's gone. A severe famine arose in that country, and he began to be in need. Look how bad it was, verse 15. So he went and he hired himself out to one of the citizens of that country who sent him into the fields to feed the pigs. This is where he's found himself in verse 16. And he was longing to be fed with the pods that the pigs were eating. Nobody gave him anything. Verse 17, God cracks his heart of stone with the famine. And when he came to himself, how many of my father's hired servants have more than enough? And here I am, dying of hunger. You know, it's, it's when the famine hits. Jesus picks up the theme. It's when the famine hits that, that there he is with the pigs and his conscience breaks and God awakened his heart to turn back to the love of the Father. Look, if you've got a prodigal son or daughter in your life, you've got a prodigal, when you pray for your prodigal, when you pray for that prodigal, you pray God brings a famine into their life. 
You pray that God brings uh, misery, that, that God makes it so that sin is so distasteful and life will be so terrible. Now, you don't have to tell your prodigal you're pray, praying this. You can just say, hey, baby, I'm praying for you. They don't have to know you are praying misery down on their heads, right? But this is what we pray. You, you pray for hard mercy. Or, or, or maybe you are the prodigal. And you are in, in misery. Listen, this, is, this misery, that is a hard grace. And a hard grace brings about real hope. I want you to see God's grace in His powerful Word. I want you to see God's grace in His hard mercies. Let me give you, I'll, give you one la- I'll give you a third point, one last one, number three. I want you to see God's grace in His strong providence. You go back with me to Genesis 42. Let's pick up the story about verse 24. There in verse 24, the brothers are under conviction. Uh, Joseph, Joseph hears their conversation in verse 24. Reuben is talking. And there for the first time he realizes that his oldest brother Reuben doesn't have anything to do with his being sold off into slavery. Verse 24, Joseph gets emotional. He has to walk out of the room. Locks up the number two guy, uh, Simeon. And look at the grace in verse 25. Verse 25. He's going to send them all on their way. And notice what Joseph does in verse 25. Joseph gave the orders to fill their bags with grain. They came for that, to to fill their bags with grain. And then to take everybody's money that they had bought the grain with, put the money back into uh, the bags. And on top of that, verse 25, give them provisions for the journey. And it was done for. They don't know this is done for them. And so verse 26, they stop along the way. Verse 26, verse 27, and verse 28. Notice their reaction to this grace. Verse 26. They loaded their donkeys with the grain. They departed. And as one of them, we don't know who, opened his sack to give his donkey fodder at the lodging place, he saw his money in the mouth of his sack. Verse 28. And he said to his brother, to his brothers, my money has been put back. Here it is in the mouth of my sack. At this, their hearts fail them. They turn trembling, here it is for the first time, to one another and ask, what has God done? A couple of things, a couple of things. Here's the first one to consider. What Joseph did back in verse 25 is pure grace. Pure grace. Now take that thought and bring it with me in a bigger and grander way. What God has done for us in Jesus is pure grace. Christianity is a religion of grace. Here's the second thing to consider. Down in verse 28. Pure grace is always perplexing at first. Pure grace is hard to get a hold of. It's always perplexing. Confusing. You notice their hearts in verse 28. Their hearts are confused. They, they think this can't be right. Their hearts failed them in verse 28. Why? Because grace feels strange. It feels weird. To be given something so good after you have been so bad. Honestly, this is why the cross is so perplexing. This, this, is, this is what grace does. It takes pride away. Isn't that what Paul said in Ephesians? By grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not of yourselves. It is a gift of God. Why? So that nobody in here can boast. Verse 28, for the very first time, since we've been following the brothers, from the very, for the very first time, they recognized the hand of God's providence Working in a hard mercy. You see it at the end of verse 28? See it in the question? It's a, it's a great question. It's a question you ought to ask. What is this that God has done to us? You, you might ask it like this. <clears throat> what is it 
that God is doing. Because He's doing something, what is He doing? Maybe your heart is like the brothers. It's hard to get at. And God is breaking you to save you. Maybe you're like the prodigal. Maybe God is, is making it so He's bringing you to an end of yourself so that you now might turn and see the joy of knowing Christ. You, you see, hard grace brings about real hope, and that hope is found in the person of Jesus. You join me as we pray together with your heads bowed this morning as we go to the Lord. In a time of commitment and prayer, here at Hickory Grove, part of our tradition, part of our worship service is, is singing and praying, hearing a sermon, and then <clears throat> providing an opportunity to respond. We'd like to give you that chance immediately. For some of you, you've heard this and you are the prodigal. And God is using this to turn your heart. You want to come back. Whatever that looks like and whatever that means, you know you want to be in right fellowship with God. This morning when we sing, what we're going to do is you'll see pastors and some of our trained leaders here just to talk with you and pray with you. I'm going to invite you when we sing just to come forward. Take one by the hand and say, I need you to pray with me or, or just to pray for me. Or maybe you want to come and pray for your own prodigal. Maybe you want to pray God's hard mercies into the heart of someone that needs Jesus. You see, God's hard mercies bring about real hope, and that real hope is in Christ. Will you join me as we pray together? Father, we do thank you for the grace you've given us in Jesus. We thank you even for the hard mercies. We pray that by your Spirit and for your glory, you might call people to yourself today and be honored here. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Do you stand, please, as we sing together? <clears throat>